If you like our content, please like, subscribe, and click the notification bell to get alerts when we introduce new videos. Welcome to Module 2, Components of the IoT Network. In this presentation, we're going to look in detail at each of the relevant major components within the IoT suite, how they work, and then how they are going to connect to ecosystem solutions and partner sensors. As again, as we look at the components of the IoT suite, we have our access points, our controller, and our wired uh, controller virtual smart zone. The, the key thing here is to understand how the access point with the IoT radio is able to communicate uh, with the IoT controller. The access point and the IoT radio combined together, running the software, we call the IoT gateway. The controller is the interface that controls multiple gateways and provides interface and high level API calls out to the real world. As we look at the access point in detail, we need to understand that the access point is architected in such a way that the IoT gateway code that is running on the access point is running in a user space environment. This allows us to fully manage an interface and provide the application for the IoT gateway from a managed and secure environment while still providing access to the lower layer functions within the operating system running on the, on the access point, providing access to the radios from our silicon labs or from our, our third party vendor. So as we look at the, uh, the IoT gateway itself, the key thing to hear is to understand is that the, uh, the agent that is running within the IoT uh, gateway is providing a secure connection between the access point, the IoT gateway code and the IoT controller to provide a secure uh, encrypted communications medium. We provide the uh, security by means of a, a certificate based authentication between the IoT gateway application and the IoT controller. But this mechanism also allows us to support a hot upgrade of the gateway. So what this means is that the IoT controller as we roll out new features and capabilities, we're able to upgrade the IoT gateway code inside the access point without the need to redeploy a whole new virtual smart zone image. The host P interfaces provide a complete in, uh, call into the uh, subsystems within the access point. So mostly for the IoT gateway, those functions are the driver for the IoT radio, the interfaces to the major interface ports, for example, the serial port or the USB port, and then out through the chipset and out into the external USB port or SPI port within the access point or within the, the device that allows us to communicate with the, the radio on the edge. We actually provide a communication from the IoT gateway to the IoT controller using IP because IP allows us a lot more flexibility within the network. And it also means that we don't need to open up a whole lot of additional security concerns within people's existing deployed network. It provides us with a, a authentication and security, but it's also very limited on the amount of resources that we're taking from the access point. So if we use a lot of IoT capability, it's too easy for denial of service attack to come in on an IoT radio, whereas our approach allows us to limit the resources the IoT gateway code has, and therefore it won't impact the performance on the access point and limits the potential uh, for any kind of denial of service or radio attack on the, uh, the IoT solution. We also run in an islanded platform, which means that we are limiting the amount of resources that we're using, both from a CPU and from a memory perspective. So that again, we don't want any issues with IoT causing problems with our wireless or our Wi-Fi network. One of the key things then really is to, is to understand is that this provides us with a single interface from our access point to our controller. It's very well managed and it provides a, a, a single uh, point of contact from the access point into the controller, which means that nothing can try and break in or out through the IoT network to get access into the rest of the network that's been deployed. So we're providing really a point-to-point -point connection between the controller and each of the access points that have been deployed. On the other side of it, we have is the IoT controller portion. So the IoT controller is running a, a whole lot more functionality around the IoT arena. So the key thing here is that the, the IoT controller itself is a Ubuntu based operating system, always kept up to date with the latest OS patches and features and capabilities. It has a minimum requirement of two virtual cores and a, a, about four to eight gigabytes of RAM is a typical 
kind of deployment and a 20 gigabyte of virtual disk space. So this kind of outlines the, the minimum requirements that you need to plan for your virtual machine deployment, either in a cloud environment or on a, 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 a piece of hardware that you're deploying in your data center or on site. We also provide secure APIs, both northbound and southbound. So out to the access point through our MQTT, but also through a, a secure API, and then also out to third party cloud services, to APIs or, or, or host interfaces on the northbound interface side, on the internet communication side. Then we also use a secure MQTT connection between our access points and our IoT gateways and the IoT controller. MQTT is a very well understood subscribe publish mechanism, but by using a secure MQTT, we're able to ensure that the data is protected between the access point, the gateway and the IoT controller and vice versa, so that nobody can try and come in through the MQTT path into the gateway and to try and take control of devices that are attached to the, uh, the Zigbee or Bluetooth radios. The key thing here also is that the gateways are managed by the controller and they can only be managed by the controller. The controller takes ownership of those gateways and until the, the gateway is owned by a controller, no IoT functions or capabilities are possible and nobody is able to communicate directly to the IoT gateway running inside the access point. It must go through the Ruckus IoT API interface. We've also included as part of the platform a full failover redundancy capability. So effectively, you can now have two IoT controllers deployed and the IoT controllers will synchronize with each other all of their databases, activity and communication. And if for some reason one IoT controller goes down due to a hardware, software or power outage, the secondary controller automatically takes over and normal operation resumes without any outage. One of the key things then is where do you deploy your IoT controller? So we support a whole range of different uh, deployment models. Today we can support both Linux uh, KVM environments or a VMware ESXi uh, deployment or any combination of those in third party cloud deployments as well. So on an AWS or an Azure cloud environment, you can deploy and provide the virtual machine environment on, a, on, a, on either a local host, a cloud or more of a hybrid approach if that's something that you're looking for. Then on top of that, we also have the, the capability to do firmware delivery from the virtual smart zone. Obviously, the access point is managed and, and controlled by the virtual smart zone and the IoT gateway controls is coming from the IoT controller. So we've mainlined all of our IoT capabilities now into our virtual smart zone. So if you're using 5.1 or, or any of the newer virtual smart zone builds, you have IoT capability now intrinsically built into the, the virtual smart zone firmware that is being delivered. And all it needs really is to plug in the IoT controller, connect it to any access point with the radio, and you can switch on IoT at that point. When we start looking at IoT, we have to think about endpoints. And one of the key things to look at when you're looking and considering endpoints is, is what type of, of endpoint device are you trying to connect? You know, we've talked about the access point, the gateway and the controller, but really the, the part that a lot of people really focus on is the actual endpoint, the, the device that's connecting and providing us data. So there's a couple of things we need to look at. And, and one of those is, do we go standards based or do we go a proprietary approach? Um, if we go down the standards approach, then we have radios like Zigbee and Bluetooth. We have LoRa and we have Z-Wave, our st industry standard radio technologies that are out there. Sensors are, are commercially available and easy to find. And then there are a whole range of adaptions of those radio technologies that have been done to add additional features and capabilities. So the nice thing is by going down the standards approach, pairing and capability exchange is already very well defined in the standard. Encryption and secure encryption data exchange is also part of that. And all of the uh, API command and control can also be obfuscated and, and removed. So people don't need to worry about how that structure works. One of the other ways you can look at it though is there are certain companies out there that have taken one of these industry standard radios and they've implemented their own view of it. So, you know, a lot of strategic alignment, uh, strategic partners that are out there have taken, for example, Zigbee and they've run their own protocol on top of that. So they've maybe run their own encryption protocol, their own packetization of data over the Zigbee standard. Now, the nice thing is the actual Zigbee radio is the same. So it just becomes a software change for us to be able to support some of these more proprietary 
uh, radio implementations if they're built on a standard radio technology. So we, we work with a number of strategic apartment, strategic alliance partners, and we have a direct engagement with them. So we will work with their engineering team, with their sales and their go-to-market teams to align and come up with a solution that works well between the two organizations so that we can correctly implement their solution, fully test it, implement their API, and fully understand how we can both attached to their devices but generally they they also want us to attach to a service on the back end so if you take a door lock manufacturer it's no good just connecting to the door lock we need to be able to take that data from that lock and forward it into a server or a cloud service on the back end so we need to integrate their api and validate that that capability that involves quite a lot of work from a an SDK, an API and a partner validation perspective. And it's it's all designed and developed based on the alliance and the, the working structure between the two organizations. So as we look at standard devices, one of the key things really is how do you take any standard radio technology and make that work with those partners? And the answer is that we, we integrate all of that capability into the IoT suite. So we can take any number of the existing protocols that we currently support and actually bring the, all of that data through the standard APIs into the IoT controller. That allows us to support a wide range of partner solutions and standard devices. So we can work with any number of manufacturers on any number of different uh, devices just by adhering to industry standard protocols. As we then work with strategic partnerships, we can do the same thing, but this time we're doing a lot more of the integration. So we will integrate within to the IoT controller, both from an SDK level, from a programming language perspective, but also within the rules engine. So now we're, we're looking at how we can take the strategic partnership and not just provide a connectivity for their sensors, but how we can then add value to that connectivity. So by putting a door lock online doesn't really help a lot of people to add value so that yes, they can connect the doors, they can reduce their installation costs and they can reduce the number of gateways that are needed to provide connectivity for all these door locks. But if they can then bring that information back into the rules engine, we can now start doing additional things and tying events into additional services, for example, door locks into cameras and we can start detecting events and identifying people uh, as part of that events process. So it's about bringing the strategic partnership not only to provide a small solution, but also then how to build that up and provide a much larger platform that is able to provide more capabilities going forward. Mm -hmm.